SMEs and SMEs are concerned. And by the time we leave this place, I believe we will be better informed. Yes, with that, I think we should go straight into the business that we have for this afternoon as I call on the lead paper presenter, Mrs. Bumi Lawson, to present her paper. Um, she has 20 minutes to present this paper. The discussions have um, maybe 12 minutes each to discuss or to critique the paper. And then we'll have time for questions and wrap up. Thank you very much. Good um, afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I stand on the same protocol, but I want to explain to the president of the Institute. It's indeed an honor to be here. Um, as I was sitting and noticed my first presentation, actually, as a, a night time seminar. But let me also first start by saying my name is Bumi Lawson. I'm a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants. My number is 5535. And so it's really indeed an honor to be here to present um, to you. I recall ages ago when I asked a question at an annual conference such as this, the lady who was responding responded, oh, baby accountant. So today, <laughs> I'm sure I'm not, but it is, um, I hope it's inspiring for those that are here today that maybe have just recently qualified so that they too can know that they can contribute to society and also give back at the conference. I want to talk particularly about SME, the subject that I have been very, very passionate about. Um, and I do feel, as um, the past president said, the chairman of this session said, that we have spoken so much about SMEs. Um, why do we keep repeating it? And I think it's because that illness has not yet been cured. And um, I even think that we are even facing a near-death situation if we do not address those issues. A series of governments have come and they keep talking about um, SMEs and what they would do. So what I've done is to outline a presentation that focuses on where we are today, what should be done, and suggestions that accountants and governments can do to ensure that we move this economy forward. Okay, so, um, as I said, I will do a brief where, introduction where we are, what SME really contributes to the economy, and suggestions, and that's where I feel that we should spend more time on. I put up this number because this is the number of people we will have in 2050, according to the World Bank. One Nigerian is added every six seconds to the population of Nigeria. 2050 is simply 32 years ago. It is still during our lifetime. Um, it means that between now and that 2050, we are going to add approximately 250 million Nigerians to the current number that we have. Um, today, we estimate that we are 190 Nigerians and we are not able to employ all our youth. I want to talk about this quote about President Roosevelt when he was addressing Americans just um, before the end of the Great Depression. And he talks about how to spur economic growth. He said, and I paraphrase because he used I, and I said, we have forgotten or do not want to remember the infantry of our economic army. The infantry in an army are the ground foot soldiers who actually transform wars and make the difference between who wins and who loses. And he was pointing out that in an economy, when you are looking at economic growth, you have to look at economic growth from the bottom up. The average man, woman, child in the street needs to actually feel the impact of economic growth for there to be sustained and inclusive economic growth. In Nigeria, what we have been implementing is a top-down economic growth policy. We focus on large companies, large projects, and all of that. And we find that we keep hoping the economic growth would tickle down to the bottom of the pyramid, but it never happened. Whereas those economies that have been able to grow have actually focused on the bottom up, where
when the average man is able to run his business, he's generating income, you will find that there will be sustained economic growth. So briefly, I'll go on to where are we today. I feel that Nigeria as a nation, we are facing a grave emergency because of that population growth. If we do nothing, how do we employ 250 million people? That's not even to add on the over 50% of our youth that are on or underemployed currently today. So, corruption is one of our issues. And I say here that the average small business owner is not reaping what they are sowing. You know, there is a saying, you reap what you sow. In Nigeria, most entrepreneurs work hard, day in, day in night, they struggle. But the locus, I use locus of corruption, is the way the plant before it can be harvested. And the grounds of leadership ensures that we do not have enough rain to ensure that we have a bountiful harvest. So people, when it comes to corruption, people always think, oh, we are the mercy of government's corruption. But the price of corruption on each and every one of us is really high, and each of us can do something about corruption. Corruption leads to poverty because there will be economic growth. So we have poverty. Currently, we estimate that we are 47% of the entire Nigerian population live on less than $1.90 a day. We had initially actually started improving in terms of corruption, but we are now going backwards. What has happened is that we had a recession, of course, as you know, but growth rates are actually smaller than population growth rates. We are estimated to grow different indicators between 2.6 to 3% each year, and yet the economy is only growing at 1% currently. And in the last two years, we actually had um, a recession. So where the economy is not growing faster than the population, we are going to see that people on average will continue to be in poverty. And the sad report that came out that Nigeria is now, unfortunately, the capital for poverty because we have more people, 87 million Nigerians living in poverty compared to India that even has over 2 billion in population, having only 73 million um, people living in poverty. So, and in Nigeria, poverty rates continue to increase. The number of people falling into poverty continues to increase. So, we have, it has happened before when poverty eroded the wealth that we have created in Nigeria. Despite all our oil revenue, in the year, when you compare 1970 to 2000, this statement says that over two, at, in 2000, the average per capita was $260, which was just one third what it was in 1970. So that's like going backwards, and we are where if we do nothing, we will be going backwards to what has happened to us before. So we don't think, oh, it's not something, it's something that would never happen. If we do nothing, it will happen and it has happened before. I talked about youth unemployment. 52% it is too high. Most economists talk about four or single digits unemployment. Nigeria, we're talking about 52 on and under um, employment. So, of the active workforce of 85 million people, 16 million are totally unemployed. Of course, it shows in the street and in the news and reports. But I also want to highlight some of the things that we can do for economic growth. And really, for economic growth, it is a planned set of actions. It doesn't just happen. And usually, the budget and how we spend is how we determine what is going to happen in terms of economic growth. So let's look at what Nigeria has been doing in terms of its budget. Our total budget for 2018 is 9 trillion um, naira. Of that, one of the things I just wanted to highlight there was that internally generated funds represented over 28% of income. Oil income, if we look at those charts, I hope you can see them. 
in 2.9 trillion in 2018. It did not even cover the wage cost of governors, which was at 3 trillion naira. So, if we just estimate that our oil revenue is to fund government, truly every other thing, we average Nigerians are the ones funding economic growth with our taxes, which comes into tax rates, company, company tax, VAT tax, and so on. Who are those that actually pay those taxes? It is these small businesses. In Nigeria, um, Smedan estimated that we have less than about 1,000 large companies, whereas 37 million are their number of small companies. I've always wondered why tax can be easier. Of the 37 million, if on average everyone pays 100,000 naira per annum, which is 10,000 naira per month, you actually have 3 trillion in tax revenue, higher than the entire tax we have now. So I feel that it should be simplified forms of taxation. Oil revenues are no longer in our control. That chart shows you what happened in 2016 where we had less than a trillion naira in revenue. So in 2018 we have 2.9, we estimate we will have 2.9 billion, but it is not really in our control. It depends on the market and oil prices. So we cannot depend on oil revenue, is the case I'm trying to point out here. But how have we been spending? Government recently, I mean in 2017, released the Economic Recovery and Growth Program and has clear schemes for how to grow the economy. If you read that report, I feel it is a very well articulated plan laid out. One of the key pillars was to improve industrialization, that is to diversify away from oil. But we have not been able to do that because I feel that in the budget allocation, we have not allocated budgets to where it will actually make economic impact. For instance, if you look at the expenditure, significant amount of it goes into the current expenditure, basically wages and salary. Our debt too is growing, but more importantly is the nature of our debt. If you look at the chart, the one in the middle, 1.7 trillion is used to repay domestic debt, signifying that government is borrowing heavily from the economy. What does that do? It crowds out commercial loans and equity capital that small businesses could have used to grow their business. So we are not able to actually assess funds. So when people complain about banks not lending, there's no access to finance for small business, I've always said we should encourage government to reduce domestic borrowing. There's no government that does not live on borrowing, but not. I feel that domestic borrowing does a double damage because there was a time that treasury bills were effective rates of 21%. Why would you lend to an SME as a single digit or less when you can lend to government and go, go to sleep? So it's easy for you to collect savings from the masses, 2%, lend to government at 21 and nobody is lending to the private sector. If you look at the indicators of um, CBN published, private credit that goes to the sector for banks, it has shown a consistent decline as a percentage of total credit over time. So we are not allocating our budgets to where we actually need it to go. Now, I've uh, talked about our budget, what we are doing there. In capital expenditure, we've estimated about 2.1 trillion. So, this, in terms of allocation, I do feel that we have increased our allocation to capital expenditure. The key with capital expenditure, though, is that we should fund specific projects that lead to economic growth. So, you ha we have a strategy, which is our economic uh, recovery growth plan. But the budget does not reflect an implementation of that plan. So we are all accountants, you know, the company comes up with a strategy. But now does the budget just based on each department say you have six or seven departments, so how much do you need? That's not how it should be done. So in the capital project, you see that it's all against different ministries, 
without a prioritization. What would have expected that with the statutory allocation, for instance, if you say one of the key pillars for economic growth is SMEs, then there should be significant investment in that area. But we do not see. So this basically just shows the capital appropriation budget, a list of departments. By the time you even drill down to those departments and find out ministries, what they are actually doing, you will find that this is not capital projects that are investment type. It may be, oh, I want to build an office complex or, you know, things like that. Of course, there are some roads and there are some projects, but the point I'm trying to raise is that we are not investing enough of our revenues in capital um, projects that leads to economic growth. So those are some of the things that we need the government to look at. Now, 410 million Nigerians by 2050. How do we achieve? What do we do about that? If we do nothing, we are sitting on the ticket time bomb. The first thing, a lot of people argue what we should do about human resources. It is key that we transform our human resources to human capital. But it is also an emergency that we need to make sure that we are able to generate revenue income to live a good life. That really is what we should do to promise our citizens. And it is true micro, small businesses that will be able to achieve that. So it is critical to our future. It is even more critical because of that population growth that we are expecting um, to see. So what do SMEs contribute? This is obvious. But I want to specifically look at statistics for Nigerian SMEs. We say they create employment. Currently, even though we feel SMEs are dying, within five years it's estimated that over 80% of SMEs die, they still are the ones providing 84% of employment in Nigeria. This um, 37 million SMEs that we have in Nigeria, done by the survey by Smedan, Smedan estimates that each, on average, SMEs employ only 1.6 persons. Imagine we are able to turn that to three persons per SME. We would actually have a human capital shortage. So what I've done here is to just multiply the three, 37 by three. On average, most SMEs should even have, I mean, the definition is that we should have between 10 to 200 staff, and we call medium or small. I'm even using only three. If we can increase on average to three, we find that we will be able to gainfully employ every single person, even to accommodate our expected growth in population. What are the challenges that SMEs face? This was also taken by a survey that Medanov did to actually go out and ask SMEs. So it's not government sits down and comes up with a prescription. What do they face? Number one, shortage of skilled manpower. And if I want to talk about education, that's another topic, but it's true. Our education system is not producing what the economy needs for real growth. Weak infrastructure was the second thing. Multiple taxes, poor access to finance, and policy inconsistency, which is basically the enabling environment. And this has all led to rapid death of SMEs. And um, Smithen have done this study over two different periods, you know, two years ago and so on. And one of the key things that we saw was that of the 37 micro and small businesses, over 33 million of them, almost that 98 percent, are micro. It was consistent when they did it in 20, um, 2010 and the same in 2013. It shows that micro businesses are not growing to become small. Small businesses are not becoming medium. And I'm sure if you did a study of how many medium are becoming large, you may find zero. Whereas that's not the case in developed and booming economies, where you can talk of companies like Amazon that is, and Apple that has become a trillion dollar based valuation company. These are companies that started in Galaxy during at least my lifetime and I'm sure the lifetime of most of us here. Why are Nigerian companies not growing that way? We, the Sweden study also showed that the age structure of most entrepreneurs was between 24 and 50. 
which is still the youth population of Nigeria. So we can use growing and micro and small businesses to actually engage our uh, youth. So I basically summarize the five key issues facing um, small businesses here. So my suggestions in terms of what do we do to actually truly grow SMEs. The first and foremost for me is that we actually need to improve skills in that area. And accountants have a significant role that they can play. Number one I put there is that I look through the ICANN um, curriculum, the subjects and so on and so forth. We need to develop in Nigeria a policy that drives entrepreneurship and encourage it through all our educational system, including professional development. So I would enjoy that I can itself have a specific course. I know that maybe under the subject of the case study or business and, and so on, so you will talk about businesses, but we need a specific program to drive entrepreneurship. Accountants have been shown to become wonderful entrepreneurs because you look at the numbers, you know the business and but I do feel that if we add entrepreneurship in terms of market analysis, season business opportunities, innovation, we should actually drive that. And it's not only the accounting profession, I think across all, from medicine to engineering and so on and so forth. It should be a core focus. Everyone should now put on the cap of having an SME development mentality. Number two, we talked about the issue of corruption. We should not be a part of corruption. Everyone has a role to play. I highlighted this issue of tax collectors because that's what a lot of SMEs complain about. That, that multiple taxation. And some of the consultants that we use are largely accountants. Letter A is their A. I support that we need more people paying taxes. But I do not support where one person who pays tax is now overtaxed just to meet the target for um, tax, um, tax revenue. Let's widen the basket. If we know the CAC registers companies, how many companies have they registered? If I even use the example of tax, 7 million. It's easy to cross check who has paid and who hasn't. And I can bet you from the statistics, we will have at least 30 million of that 37 who have not paid a couple in tax. So why are we overboarding the ones that are paying? So those are some of the things. And so therefore, let us, as we become consultants to the tax um, inland revenue, advise on how to widen the tax gap. And one of the reasons why I feel that simple taxation, simple method, that was successful, percentage of an amount sold. Simple, easy to calculate. I think if we incorporate a culture of flat taxes for SMEs, ranging from, depending on your size, from micro to small, everybody pay X amount, maybe micro pay 1,000, small pay 5,000, big pay 10,000 per month, we will even collect more taxes. We won't even have to set up a machinery to keep doing tax audits and things like that. Then, in your small business, small and medium practices, create a specific department for SMEs. I know one of the topics that will be discussed in this is what are the roles or the expanded roles for audit firms. SMEs need support. One of the key things that we find lacking in SMEs is that they do not have access to the strategic brains that big companies will have. How do we develop strategy? How can we advise them? They can't afford to hire, you know, the accounting firms or the store that they need. But multiple, if you come down with your fees and you increase the large number of people that you can serve, you will find that it's a viable business, um, you can become a viable business part of your um, practice. So focusing on strategy, accounting, I like the software thing that was presented, finance, joined by a board, even if it's an advisory board, Venture capital, so that it's not always loans. Anytime we talk about SME, we are always saying loan, 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 loan. What SMEs need is patient, long term capital that, that equity provides. So that we are not focusing too much on always um, interest rates and so on and so forth. Let me quickly rush to 
government interventions. Here, there's, I use the Science um, Commission report. It was a report that was done by the World Bank, so, and it reviewed over 75 countries across the world over 25 years to see those who are growing. And they highlighted 13 of them that consistently grew at 7% GDP for 25 years straight. Not an up and down that uh, Nigeria has witnessed. And highlighted what was it called um, common flavor. That was the similar traits that all of them had. The first being that there was an, a focus on export, that's integrating with the world, that their products become competitive. That tells you about quality, about efficiency, about productivity. Then mobi mobility of resources, especially labor, telling you that there were competent labor people to move from various sectors of the economy as required over that 25 years. So if it's a Greek and you are Greek economist, that's what you know, and then we want to go into technology, we could have adequate resources to ensure that we could do um, provide the skills in those various sectors. Then there was a high savings and investment culture. The people on average were saving because government came up with different vehicles for saving better long term bonds and so on, but also the banking sector, investment stock markets and so on and so forth. That helps to ensure that there is long-term fund. So, for instance, as we established the pension fund here, was a good thing to encourage savings. The problem, though, is that when you look at how are we spending or investing our pension funds, it is government, again, that has taken most of that burden. So there is not as much percentage of that that has now been invested back into the economy, in infrastructure, and so, so on and so forth. McKinsey also did a study, I think they released it just in September. They highlighted 18 countries that had similar growth, 5% over 50 years consistently. Those same factors were the points that they also raised to ensure that we had economic growth. So government intervention required is to focus. I told that government to say, SME or nothing. Businesses just need to grow. It has to be one of the key things, and it should show through in all the budget, everything that we are spending. So when we are making decisions about power, technology, broadband, water, we are trying to see how we improve the productivity of our business sector. For growth of SMEs, there should be incentives to encourage businesses to actually grow, not over burden them with taxation. Um, so, for instance, if we, are, if we set up an SME, there should be grants, long-term loans and access. So, for instance, some of those that have been mentioned, like the MSDS fund that we have by the CBS, the Agric fund, and so on and so forth. And increase budgetary allocations to SMEs. If you look through the budget, the only very, in fact, the medium, for instance, one of the things I would say is that if you say it is critical for our future that we should have small businesses thriving. Should Sweden, Sweden itself become a ministry and not reporting on that trade and investment that is easy and we are not, you know. So, if it is key, let us highlight more those um, roles. So, in summary, we are the giants of Africa, <laughs> of the world, but we need to really answer that question. So, it is not debatable. It is not debatable, and we have everything that we need to be able to do that. We just need to ensure that execution is done. One of the key things that I find in Nigeria is that we have fantastic plans from the Vision 2020. So, now in fact, a lot of items have been a part of it and rounded up, a part of all of those documentations. Execution has always been our weakness. We need to ensure that we focus on where those things would yield, we invest in the 20% that would yield the 80% basically. There's a lot of um, things to read about SME and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Um, let's go to the discussion. Okay. Uh, Mr. Ajba, I will put it up in the Good afternoon.
Honourable Distinguished uh, Presidents, Conference Chairman, Session Moderator, all past Presidents, um, Distinguished Colleagues, Ladies and Gentlemen. Um, I think I'm just going to have to crash through the presentation because I don't know how this can be done in 10 minutes. Okay, but what I'll do in summary is so seeds of thought, both in the minds of the SME owners and especially in the minds of my constituency, the S and M practitioners, the small and medium practitioners, and indeed practice in the whole of um, Nigeria. Uh, the past, the, the previous paper was, um, it's just going to make it difficult for me because sometimes when you present after such an erudite presentation, it makes my um, I've written something on the synopsis of this but that has been very well covered. Except one thing, there are some kernels which we need to concentrate on. One thing that I learned today is the highly useful demographic of these 74,000 Smedan numbers plus the number of micro SMEs that drive about 90 odd percent of our economy. If you have a highly youthful demographic, 25 and upwards, it brings something a bit new to the table. In fact, many of us here, we prize our experience, we prize the decades we have had in practice. But when you are dealing with a youthful demographic, sometimes that experience may be a weakness if you don't understand today's demographic. Anything or any information that you cannot access on a mobile phone is information that may not be accessed by certain people. So 20 years, 30 years experience, when you are dealing with a youthful demographic, by cross a disconnect. The kind of problems that happen between parents and their children. Now, I want to ask the question, how many of us here are SNP employees, owners, practitioners? Can I see a show of hands so I would know where? We work in small to medium scale practices, all this time. Okay, so I'm in familiar territory. How many of us work for or own companies which can be defined as SMEs, i.e. companies that turn over between, let's for the sake of argument, say between zero to maybe 300, 500 million. How many? Okay. A lot of people are shy there because if you are not working for an SMP and not working for an SME, how many of us here are in civil service? How many of us are in academics? Okay. The picture that we can see is that regardless, like in any uh, slice of Nigerian population, there's still a high or relatively high number of SME practitioners, sorry, SME owners, and even within our accounting audit professional constituency, a high number of SME practitioners. Question Can SMPs, that's small to medium practices, assist SMEs with financing, accounting, and other vital resource needs? which will reposition them, the SMEs, to profitability. Can anyone give me a short answer? Can SMEs make SMEs bankable? Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. Yes or no?
and the statement in our audit report, the entity, uh, the, the, the financial statements show a true and fair view of faithfully represent the activities and state of affairs. Is it that statement that makes a, a company bankable? Yes or no? So, does the audit report, which is, with all due respect, still necessary and relevant, and it is statutory, or does that audit report make an SME bankable? Yes or no? Without that audit report, will many of us be signing audit reports for SMEs? If entities did not have to audit their accounts, will we have the auditor client relationship with SMEs? No. The transaction between an SME and an SMP, and I'm speaking from painful experience, painful, but also very fulfilling and exciting, and there's a bright future. But right now, the transaction between the SMP and the SME owner is called a distress purchase. He is only paying my audit fees because he or she or the entity must, under law, audit their accounts. So a lot of my audit fees or income profile is based on that distress relationship. In the laws of life, a distress relationship is not sustainable. We keep saying we want Nigeria to join the International Committee of Nations in terms of progress. I have to crash the presentation into 10 minutes. I know my time is almost up. In the UK, there is something called the audit threshold. Are we familiar with that term? The audit threshold. I think below 10 million pounds turnover, 5 million pounds as total assets, you don't have to submit audited accounts. For annual accounts, you just submit uh, compiled accounts that are compliant with the gap of the UK. In the EU, they have something similar. Let me just read out some. This is just uh, food for thought. In South Africa, for example, any company with assets under 5 billion rand, and that company is not a public interest entity, and it has not been volunteered in their articles of association, once you are below 500, uh, 5 million rand, you do not have to submit audited accounts as part of your annual results. In Singapore, the same thing. Turn over $10 million, Singapore dollars and below. You don't have to submit audited accounts. In the EU, turn over of 8 million euros and below, or as set by the EU members, there is exemption from annual audits. We know how IFRS came into Nigeria. We know how many of our anti-money laundering laws, even today's NOCLA, the NOCLA obligation that we practitioners are under, they are things that start in various geographies of the world, various sectors of, uh, parts of the world, and we gradually adopt them in Nigeria. We've spoken about audit exemption. I don't think we should plan a 15-year future, that's us SMPs, without taking this audit exemption into consideration. We are there to be an audit exemption thing in the next 10 years. Many of us know the negative adverse impact it will have on our income profile. Why am I saying this? Because the same thing that will make us more relevant to SMEs 
making them more bankable is actually the answer to what we as MPs, which we practitioners are actually facing, or whether we know it or not, as a serious risk. It's a risk because eventually, whether we like it or not, we can't bind it, we can't say it is not our portion, we can't say God forbid, these things are the ways of the world and gradually the giants of Africa must do us, must become relevant. So it means that we need to plan this kind of future. Good news, to make an SME more bankable, the SNP has to be able to provide advice beyond faithfully represents and true and fair. So we see that there is a nexus of destinies. To make us more relevant to the SNPs, it means we need to go beyond. And I speak as a long member of the, uh, a lot of membership numbers have been quoted today, very intimidating, so I will not say my own. <laughs> but it is for the um, With all due respect, with all the experience I have, within the constraints in which we operate and which we should respect. Constraints, I mean statutory, the constraints of ICANN, the ethical constraints and all that. We still need to change the way we are doing things. Otherwise, when the time comes, we as MPs will suddenly find ourselves adrift. And also, we will find ourselves irrelevant to the SMEs that need our services. But they need our services beyond distress purchase. We need to add value. How do we add that value? We are already doing it. We are already doing it, but in, an, in a disorganized way. Um, we are all practitioners here. There is no knocking, nothing personal, but we know that in our market we have the big four and the others. But like in any economy, the others, we SNPs, serve in percentage terms the largest proportion of the, um, should I say, the financial population of this country, of the transactional population of this country. The truth of the matter, ladies and gentlemen, if we cannot do, at least mirror, the offerings of the big four to their clients, if you cannot mirror it, to your clients, then there's a huge disconnect. Being able to offer full service to the SME clients you have today, more than you have been offering it in the past, is our path to a prosperous future as an SME. That's the selfish interest of the SMP practitioner, but it is also the value add that the SME is actually looking to the professional for. They are not paying us for true and fair. They are not paying us to tell them that they are going to pay government. Thank you. Um, all I wanted to do today is to show that seed. But we have to do more than we are doing as SMEs today for our clients to make them more bankable. Auditing them and saying their books are fine is well, well and good. But are we giving them advice concerning their cash flows for that year? How they could do things better? Are we giving them corporate governance advice? Are we giving them even succession advice? Seeing that the driver of the business focuses too much on the business, focuses too much on the process of the business rather than growing the business. Clients try and get a number two. Do we even know that as a problem? Talk less of are able to advise a client. Do we know 
something that can add to or enhance the strategy of our client's business, such as that advice will enhance the client's future profits. Are we able to provide that advice like some firms are able to provide? The answer to those few questions, to those seeds, are where our future prosperity as SMPs lie, and where, in, more importantly, our relevance to the SME, to the SMEs lie. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Shukana, for that uh, seed that you have sown. Which church is your own? You know, I know you very well. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. I will call on my brother to present his book, and Adi Ali Muhammad. All right, thank you very much. Um, let me stand on protocols established and uh, cut to the chase and go straight to pick up where the last speaker left off. I'm here to make a proposal of assuring the prosperity of the SMEs in this room, the SMPs, from the perspective of how do we revive Nigeria's economy through agribusiness SMEs. There are some key points I want to take away from here. The speakers before me did mention words about transparency and accountability. Here, I had words about small and medium practices making their future not out of the distress of SMEs, but out of creative prosperity for the SMEs. Number three, it's obvious that SMEs need a lot of services from SFPs. Accounting, audits, legal, bankable feasibility studies, corporate governance and the rest. But, before you do all that, value has to be created first before value is consumed. My point of view today is to show that yes, value can be created, but specifically from agriculture as a business. And let me give a little bit of a background. This is an economy with a population of 200 million people plus. We feed Nigeria, we feed neighboring countries, our products go all the way to Central Africa and as far as Sudan, Southern Sudan inclusive. We have to feed 200 million people three times a day. Out of Africa's 35 billion US dollars, according to the FDB food import bill, I understand that Nigeria's estimates about 22 billion US dollars out of that. Now, that is both a challenge and an opportunity. Now, if we can work with agribusiness SMEs relying on the support of SMPs, we believe we will have a virtual pros prosperity that helps everyone. This is just a preamble. Now, there are some numbers that I wanted to present, but obviously, the penultimate speaker and the other speaker have already mentioned those numbers. These are growth rates against U.S. constants, and the McKinsey report that just came out in September this year. All these have been mentioned, so let me skip over them. Now, let me go straight to MSMEs, and I want to posit that, and comfortably so, that out of the 37 million SMEs in Nigeria, agriculture and its value chain and all the components of the horizontal agriculture and vertical projects can actually account for a huge percentage of that 37 million if we're creative at it. And we all have these numbers. Those have been mentioned. Now, let me dive into agribusiness SMEs and their impact on the Nigerian economy. I'm not talking of oil and gas, I'm not talking of telecoms, I'm not talking of engineering, and I'm talking of construction. 
I'm referring to agribusiness. Agribusiness gives us the food, the fiber, and other commodities that we need. The food, feed, and fiber that keeps every living thing going. We know that in the full year of 2017, while the rest of the economy was going at 0.3%, agri alone contributed about 3.5%. In real terms, during that year, agriculture contributed 72.2 trillion to real GDP, which in nominal terms was about 23.9 trillion. This same sector, even without intervention, without structural support, is bound to grow to, to give growth of about 8.37% in the next three years. NASA, a corporation wholly owned by the Central Bank of Nigeria, tackles agricultural finance and risk management through a structured approach to create businesses that are financeable, that are bankable, that can create real value so that they will have sufficient revenue to pay all the SMPs in this room. In every agricultural commodity value chain, all of them can be broken down into a simple structure. It doesn't matter whether it's cocoa, beekeeping, livestock for beef or milk, uh, rice, maize, all of them have generic structures. Just like in oil and gas, you have pre upstream, upstream, midstream, and downstream segments. In the pre upstream segments, you have verticals, which include projects. For example, fertilizer belongs to the pre upstream because it's an input. In and of itself, fertilizer is not a consumable item, it's a strategic item. You have seed, you have tractor and equipment, irrigation equipment. You have a search for innovation, you have essential services, you have animal insemination, you have feed for animals. Then of course, in the upstream segment is why most of you in this room call farmers. Farmers basically are small SMEs, especially when they are structured, that convert input to output in a very logical, economic way. In that segment, you have primary producers, which most people call farmers that produces the chicken you eat, the eggs, the milk, the cereal, the complex, and even some of the lotions you use in your body. Because a large part of the substrate for most lotions is sheer butter base. Of course, after primary production, in order to capture value and preserve value and to transmit value, you need to have a mixing segment, where you have agro-processing, which involves transport, haulage, conditioning, preserving value, storing, and also those that provide middleman functions. But all of these previous uh, streams, uh, segments have to service the end market, which comprises the industrial market, the export market, and the consumer markets. So, if we have this opportunity, we have 200 million people who have a large bulge of youth, youthful demography, what do we need to convert those assets those opportunities to work. We know, without saying, that we have enough land in Nigeria, 84 million hectares of arable land. We have enough water in billions of cubic meters, both underground water and surface water, almost consistent rainfall. We have sufficient labor, especially when you take on the youth vault, and the market is there, 200 million people. If we are able to properly harness these opportunities, we can achieve food security overnight, we can achieve economic growth, employment generation, foreign exchange earnings, and therefore we can even balance our trade position with other countries. But the key issues are those. Yes, you might have comparative advantage, but you cannot have competitive advantage except you are able to access for capital to convert agriculture to agribusiness. We need to have sufficient finance capital, we need to have sufficient technology capital, equipment capital, and the human capital that enables you to design a project, to manage a project, and to deliver value. In the human capital component, I can see a nexus between what the accounting community does in terms of audit corporate governance and what we want to deliver in other businesses. So, human capital. If we are able to sort out those two, combine those opportunities with those capitals, 
There are other cross-cutting issues that we have to tackle systemically. First of all, you don't treat agriculture in any segment of it as an isolation. For example, the concept of the farmer as a producer and a financiable entity does not exist. There is no way a farmer can walk off the street from any community, walk into a bank, and say, give me a loan of 250000 That is not possible. That is not going to happen. And to achieve scale and economic development, we might as well forget that dream. It won't happen. So, all our value chains are not integrated. You are not integrating input supply to primary production. Primary production is not integrated to storage and value addition. And the storage and value addition is not integrated to the specification and the demand of the end market. Therefore, we have cross-cutting issues. The value chains are broken. The infrastructure on which the value chains need to survive is not there. And we have very adverse agribusiness environments. And I like what I saw earlier, the accounting index across states, and we're trying to create the ease of doing agribusiness across states. And there is poor focus on inclusion and sustainability. And finally, where we, NASA, come in is the poor access to finance. Now, what do we do in NASA to activate this? A bit of background. NASA is a wholly owned profession of the Central Bank of Nigeria in Corporation 2013. We are just about two and a half years old, post, uh, in corporate, I mean, post establishment out of Central Bank of Nigeria. And uh, we have all the banks in Nigeria being a board member of NASA, represented by the Bank in Tan and the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and World Development sitting on our board. We have a lot of objectives there. Let me quickly go through. What is our mandate? Our mandate is first of all to fix the value chain. If we take cocoa, we start from the inputs of cocoa to production of cocoa to processing of cocoa to the production of mass or, 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 or whatever chocolate or whatever drink you want to use as a cocoa. We also redefine dimension and measure price and the risk involved. We all know banks price lending to agriculture based on their perception of risk. And we know that if we are to remove that risk, that perception goes away and the real cost of funds will be uh, made available to agriculture. Our part of our job also is to build long-term capacity for all actors, both along the financing value chain as well as the agricultural commodity borrowing value chain. Again, that is where capacity building comes in from the accounting community. We operate uh, a $500 million fund provided by the Central Bank of Nigeria across five pillars. The risk sharing pillar, the technical assistance pillar, the uh, insurance pillar, rating pillar, and incentive pillar. Now, how do we do what we do? In every segment, in every agricultural commodity, we work with research for innovation, not research and development. We ensure that all inputs are made available and we ensure that all agricultural activities are mechanized. That is to support the upstream segment. The upstream segment is where all the pre-upstream inputs are combined with nature, soil and climate to produce value, and this value must be captured, standardized, conditioned and processed and transported by the Ministry of Nature, all in an effort to service the downstream segment of the value chain, which is the industrial market I mentioned earlier, the consumer market and the export market. Now, the key thing is, for every commodity, you have got to structure the value chain finance. In all agricultural commodities, if you want to do proper SME as a business, you have got to think of working capital finance for technology providers and equipment suppliers. You have got to think of working capital finance for the primary producers whom you call farmers. You have got to think of working capital finance and asset finance for processors. And then you have got to think of what capital finance for structured consumer and retail markets. For example, if you go to any market in any city, you can't cooperate with the sell vegetable and meat and so on. These are huge turnover businesses, but they are not structured. It's difficult to finance them. If you are able to structure the USA market, Gerki market, the Aleppo market, all the markets in the big cities in Nigeria, you can imagine the capacity and the amount of financing power you can unlock because you can create facilities for them block that facility and link that demand backwards down the chain until that money reaches primary production. And on top of that, you need to deploy robust risk management tools for all dimensions of this. In any agricultural venture, you have got to tackle uh, the vertical project risk, the horizontal integration risk of that value chain, and the human behavior risk. And therefore, we support the insurance industry 
develop comprehensive insurance that covers for revenue, not covering for other elements of, uh, of, 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 of risk. Because revenue is what matters. If I can get a bank to finance any project, and I tell that bank that the revenue is self-insured, then that gives additional comfort to the bank, in addition to my guarantee, of course. Then we need to leverage technology-driven uh, uh, monitoring capacity. NASA is deploying a lot of satellite imaging and unmanned aerial system for monitoring to ensure that over a large geography we know what's going on. And we layer our credit enhancement guarantees on top of every project and we ensure that all primary producers, farmers and all businesses at SME level are not left alone. They are groups. They cross guarantee each other before we put our guarantees on them because peer pressure and governance demand that. Now, after structuring the value chain, after structuring the finance value chain, it's important too to incentivize the actors and so that they can shape their behavior. Now, that is why we have capacity building, we have orientation, and for NASA, every project that we guarantee and we support, and that project behaves well, uses the money and pays back, that project will stand to gain up to 40% interest rate from NASA for good behavior. And we have a rating scheme that will do like a bit contest to see who is the best performer in finance, who is the best performer in borrowing and using money. Now this is very complicated, it's very technical work. It's some of the work we do in supporting primary production. I'm about to finish. These are our global partners. And we have a, a model that is supposed to support you, particularly those students in agricultural faculties, in food science and technology, in social sciences, at 400 to 500 levels before they finish university. We want to start replacing the aging population of Nigerian producers with useful population. But that capture cannot happen as NYC orientation grant. We want to start that capture at 400 to 500 level uh, university uh, students. And we intend to create round table to create a champion for all those young people that are doing innovative agribusiness in various parts of the country. Um, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, we have, in our short years of existence, two and a half years or so, we have been able to catalyze up to 77.6 billion in additional lending to agriculture in this matter of two years without losing up to 1% of our own funds. We have developed innovative insurance products that cover for revenue, not even some indemnities. We are continuously providing technical assistance. And in this year alone, I think we have been able to mobilize from different sources 35 billion, that is first quarter. By now, I think we have mobilized up to 50 billion in additional lending to a lot of corporations. Some of you, a lot of you might not know how and where, but I invite all of you to be involved in agribusiness supported by that, so you see how we do it. And our model is being replicated across Africa. A lot of governments are approaching NASA to create this kind of risk sharing facility across different countries in Africa. So my final point, in conclusion, I would like to say that the economies of several nations rely on SMEs. From our point of view, the SMEs in agriculture sector should be converted from agriculture to agribusiness SMEs because it, without a business logic, no SME can get commercial and bankable financing. SMEs are proven to be highly supportive of large firms as providers of interest inputs. And in any many emerging economies, they have the chance of leapfrogging and becoming in an evolutionary pathway corporates in their own rights. The Nigerian economy depends greatly on the performance of the productive sectors, especially manufacturing, structures and culture. NASA aims to properly structure and transition agricultural values and actors in Nigeria from mere agricultural practice to optionally operating agribusinesses capable of transforming the economy. So, um, I don't want to go there. We support financiers and investors, we support agribusinesses, and therefore we support the economy in large. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, lucid presentation. Now, um, we have come to the end of the presentations by the lead paper presenter as well as the discussant. We want to have some time for questions and reaction from the audience. Let's make it to be brief. Thank you. 
Tell us your name, your membership number. My, my name is Sophie Tere Yakubu. My own question here is some of the SMEs, they created their own problem. That's why they don't last. Especially like the owners or the chairman of the SMEs. They sometimes intervene with the bonds of the SMEs using for their own partner needs. This is creating a bad situation for the growth of the SME. So how do we go about it? Thank you. My name is Clement Ojile, FC Membership Number 18571. My question goes to the last presenter from NISA. To what extent has your agency synergized with its leaders to support the MSMEs? How many can you say have been financed through this government agency? Thank you. All protocols in the option. My name is N O O. I am number 4466. Uh, the paper presenter or presenter who are coming on advice to the, on the SMP to the SME. I'm just wondering, I want to ask them if they know how difficult it is to convince our advice company. This SME we are talking about, how many of them actually take professional advice? Seriously. I want to let us know that we have one government and so many agencies. And this agency, sometimes some of their objectives, it seems they are completing our goal. For instance, we talk of that, that is Zagino, Dofina. It's one government. We do it and all that. And two, we are professionals. We have to be very realistic and tell ourselves the truth. You will see that you cannot make profit without much level to cost. And we don't consider what is this SME. No infrastructure. How can you drive anything? You talk of technology. Is there any technology without power? Can any technology run in the world without power? And we don't have power. And we are talking. Where we are over there in the Dosi, how many days we get the power? Sometimes a week will not have power at all. If you don't buy generator as well, there you are. Another thing, if you want to drive from the chain that is power more powerful than what you can use, it's a problem. And uh, fortunately, um, uh, just this recent time, I got I wrote through some uh, proposals and visit study of foreign investors trying to invest in Africa from the Middle East. And they try to look at where they can invest, Ghana and Nigeria. And they prefer to invest in Ghana because of what power. And uh, all these things I think we should tell ourselves and tell government this only power. Don't tell us about you. How many hours will it take you to move from now? If you move from the you want to go to go to Abuja, this next day you will find yourself in Abuja. What kind of Nigeria is that? How many hours should that one take us? This is all these things we should address them in reality and say the truth. Because when we gather like this, we say all sweet things and they really be sweet and we seem as if we have hope. We need these four words of this thing. As we are going out, we see that the hope is getting that. Thank you very much. And this is 9981. My question to this on the aspect of small middle scale enterprises, I have discovered from my personal scientist that finance has been the issue. My personal goal is that how do the small, medium sector have access to, if possible, zero free loan interest <laughs> to enable them to grow and try from the informal sector to the main informal sector. Uh, I appreciate the first speaker. I want to thank you for the articulated word of this paper. My question is for you, man. I just want to find out from you, you talked about the pension funds and you talked about venture capitalists and so on for SMEs. You will agree with me that most of those monies that we've paid out of, which you actually articulated and said, 
It is because of risk management and safety of the funds. So my question is this. How do you secure, how do you ensure safety of these funds when you give it to SMEs? Given the fact that we have a lot of non-performing loans right now to speak in the banking sector, how do we guarantee safety of these funds? What advice can you give to those who lend money to SMEs? Thank you. Good afternoon. protocol, My name is Mrs. Choma Joko. Um, membership number 7747 FCA. My question actually is uh, for Madam. Uh, thank you for very beautiful presentation. But there was a slide where you showed the um, challenges of SMB. Um, it was like a pie chart, but we didn't quite see the details before it was removed. But I want to say that I am the CEO of an SMB. Having worked in government for 35 years and uh, in a regulatory agency, um, incidentally, I had to do my job and in conjunction with other agencies. Now I know that we have continued to overburden the SMB because there are competing interests among the government agencies. Trying to do the same thing maybe, but each um, organization has its own agenda. Now, I am in the private sector doing my own business. But I observe that in the South South where I operate, or when my company operates, the issue of security is very paramount. The SME is ordinarily very vulnerable because of the limitation of finance. You find yourself operating in a remote area. In that remote area, power is not available to you, and where it is, is very epileptic. So you find yourself having to buy generators and use a lot of diesel. Now, what is the government doing about this power? Because it looks like you know, a lot of lip service is being paid about power. Even the diesel that is being um, imported, sometimes you have problems with your generator, with those diesel. So I don't know what I can, can do and I would like ICANN to actually step up on its interaction with government to draw some of these things to their attention and so that they can help the SMB. All right, thank you, thank you. My question is the experience I have. One, people don't really have access to information about to access these forms that are meant for SMB. If I was lucky, one day, somebody sent me a message that all female entrepreneurs should call a particular number or email VOI to access phone. I tried those channels. I first of all tried the email because I didn't know one man was telling me that they will not pick the phone call. So I could use email. So I sent email. There was no reply. I tried the phone line. There was no reply, which is not who they know. So what I'm trying to say is that they should tell these institutions or give them standards that will enable them to reach out to people. Who will be found is not available. They should be able to tell you that there's no phone now. They should be available and tell you the processes that you will follow to enable you to get the phone. All right. That's my answer. Thank you. My name is Wuyiwa Odeji, membership number 1950. I want to address uh, first Bumi uh, Lonsen. Uh, she talked about the ratio of capital in the government budget. But the fact is that Nigeria, as big as the economy is, is still not an industrial nation. So when you spend on infrastructure, in most cases, 80% or more will be imports. So you haven't really grown the economy. 
so there has to be that balance. Then I would rather go for more revenue, where people have paid their salaries regularly, where people have disposable income. Businessmen can then come in and provide services, and then you have people who can pay for services. Then secondly, banks can lend money, because salaries should be paid regularly. When I started work as a chartered accountant, we could borrow any amount, because the salary will come. People have lost that now, it affects the economy. There is no economy that thrives on cash, not on credit. Because whereas cash can be limited, credit you can expand, you know. Then, I also want to deal with uh, our environment. Nigeria has very little technology. And no country benefits in manufacturing, maximally when you don't have local technology. Sometimes we confuse engineering and technology. When you don't have technology, you have to import machinery, you have to import raw materials. At the end of the day, what you call uh, your GDP, we do not relate it to the uh, gross national product. What really grows the economy is not so much the GDP, but the growth in the gross national product, which is your production that is retained locally. GDP includes what goes up. Thank you. All producers uh, in your staff. My name is Tayo Shurubi. I'm number 1544. I uh, question uh, so the lead uh, paper presenter. Um, he, he talked about uh, Nigeria being uh, capital world capital of uh, poverty. Um, how did we get there? I think it's because we are competing worldwide and our, the value of our Naira has greatly depreciated. I remember, I mean in 2015 or so, we were about uh, 196 or so to a dollar but uh, now it's about 360 to a dollar, which means it's gone, it, I mean, it, uh, it's gone double. You know, so whatever we do in 1995, we have to do double, double that now to actually get a ranking in the world setting. You know, so what I'm, what I'm going to ask the super presenter to talk to you is um, how do we improve our exchange rate so that um, if, the, if the Naira value improves, definitely um, our ranking in the world that it will also improve. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, secondly, on the uh, to the paper uh, presenter, um, I mean... Um, Let's go ahead. Uh, yes. So on this um, value added uh, audit, um, the, the, the idea of, uh, because I am an SFP and I know that if uh, what is happening in England and uh, all over the world yeah, has to happen here, most of us should be out of business. You have uh, already said it, you know. But I want you to go in depth into what advisory services and the uh, the small practitioners add to to actually improve for them. And right. then the third. Well, let's 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 leave. Yes. Let's leave. No, no, I don't, I don't, 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 don't. We are running out of time. Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm just uh, worried that uh, government is creating too many uh, agencies. agencies All right. you know, because I believe the work they are doing from other agencies, I mean, in the cultural sector, we also have done that, you know, okay. and that is in good, uh, I mean, reducing uh, uh, right. the value of All right. uh, okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Very Thank pleased, you. sir. Thank you, sir. All put up to yourself. My name is Wadi Koshisanya, number 7884, SCA. Now, tell me from the first, uh, you know, comments, 
is it not possible to have an underwriting standard upon which this SME can operate? For example, you see an SME whereby the husband is the chairman, the wife is the managing director, the children in the school are the members of the company. Therefore, it will, they will find it difficult to, you know, access funds with that composition. But if there is an, you know, uh, I would say uniform standard upon which an SME can operate, I think it may be better. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for your insights. Because of our time, I've been told to um, we need to move very fast. I just want to give two minutes each to uh, uh, the presenter and the discussant to address some questions. You can address everything. Just address some keywords that you can remember and then we'll have. Thank you very much. Um, I want to address the one on um, how should we spend our budget to we use to pay salary or capital investment. Because, you know, I think it is a debate that government continuously faces. And it is true that in the short to medium term, if you don't pay salaries, you can't even govern the country, there will be riots and so on. But I truly want to take it to that McKinsey report and the Kent report that talks about how economies have grown. There's no, um, you know, economy, economy, the um, economy, economy is a science. It is not, um, if you do A and B, you know, you get A, B. There's, if we just continue to pay salary, this is what we have been doing. You know, um, people even argue that when we did this, um, we did this doji, then it was part of what ruined the Nigerian economy. Salary is true, it will make everybody happy to be, but it is not invest in capital infrastructure. So when we talk about power, and how if you don't have power, you don't have roads, you know, salary alone is they are spending 2.9 trillion paying salary. The entire oil revenue is paying salary. If we do not invest in infrastructure, there is no way forward. And SMEs cannot try if they are, if not increase their productivity. 50 years of study shows consistently do invest in infrastructure productivity, improve human capital, and have competent governance without corruption and we will grow. There is no magic. Do those three things and we will grow. Thank you. Um, very briefly, the very nature of an SME implies that it is set up by the owners or owner primarily to finance the lifestyle of that owner. This is a reality. Nobody a business for just a business. It is to enhance the life of the business owner. We practitioners should understand that psychology and age the experts. They will always intervene or interfere in their business. Doing it in a way that doesn't harm the business is where we come in as advisors. Concerning taking advice seriously, there is no human being also that acts itself. The issue World Bank identified, research identified, and most SME owners don't know or are not experienced enough, educated enough to know certain things, methods, deal processes for running businesses. When we get an SME to the of understanding that something is in his or her best interest, we have done our own part as professionals. That's the challenge that faces us. We just can't write them up and say they don't uh, take our advice seriously. If I know something will make my future better, I will take it. Getting to that point of knowledge is where the SMP comes in. The challenge is still ours. Thank you. And uh, my brother, do you have some comments? Yes. 
Um, the quick one, um, let me uh, make some clarifications when uh, people confuse NASA uh, with the standard definition of an agency of government. We are a business wholly owned by the central bank designed to enable agribusiness to succeed. We approach our engagement, our mandate in a business-like manner to speak the language of finance, risk management, bottom line and corporate governance. Without that, no business, whether in primary production, processing or market, can succeed in agriculture. So we speak the language that accountants in this room understand. And that is the only way you can make business to happen. Secondly, we don't finance directly. We leverage our huge balance sheet of $500 million to enable investors and financiers to put their money in opportunities that we create and we structure and we de risk. We provide up to 75% guarantees against the face value of any financial investment in the agricultural value chain. That's how we operate. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry this is where we have to end this session because of our time, because of our programs will um, we still come up here. So I want to thank you very much, wonderful audience, for your participation and for your patience. Okay, the that presentation. I'm supposed to make the presentation. So this is to, for um, this particular presenter. This is for me, Lossi. Thank you very much for your wonderful support today. God bless you. Okay, I'm supposed to go this, uh, present this one to my God. The group here, Ali, Abdul Mohammed. I hope they are listening correctly this time around. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for having time to share your thoughts with us today. Uh, God bless you. I hope you will come, will you come again when we uh, invite you. Yeah, to come, number <laughs> <laughs> No, we'll give you an FCA. You know what, what FCA is? You don't know. Um, our category of uh, something we have ACA, we have. FCA, fellow is social academy. For your own FCA is just friend of social academy. Okay, okay, last but not the least, Mr. Bodeo Sukoya, this is for you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, finally, we have a Thank you so